Hello people, welcome back to Fashion Lover for YouTube channel. I am Loic Prigeon and today we are talking about Comme des Rassons. But don't be mistaken, this brand is not from France, it is from Japan. Oui oui, thank you Loic. Wow, what a, what a guy having a small YouTube channel like mine, huh? <laughs> You've heard of Comédé Scarcons before, whether it be on the side of Converse or on Rihanna. And I find that the most fascinating thing about the brand to be the designer herself, Miss Comédé Scarcons. <laughs> This is Rei Kawakubo, and there's more that I want to talk about today than just her legacy. There are plenty of better sources for that. While Rei is considered a legendary influential designer, which I still want to touch on and explain, I recently scoured the internet for interviews with her. She infamously detests being interviewed, and through reading many of her most recent interviews, she probably wouldn't like to hear this, but I found a sense of clarity in her work. Clarity is something that she does not like to give. I also found a lot of what she had to say so relevant to today. What I want to see in the world and in fashion seemingly exists with Comme des Garçons right now. So come along and hopefully, through looking at Ray's perspective on herself, design and the world, we can better understand why she creates the works that she does. And maybe the work itself. And to do that, we're not going to be looking back at the Comme des Garçons that has existed for the past 50 years, but the Comme des Garçons that exists now, of today, the one that Ray approves of. Most people will have heard of Comme des Garçons, but it's a brand with many faces. The fact that this map of the Comme des Garçons universe exists speaks to that. But in its truest form, I think that Ray's rawest, most genuine output through Comme des Garçons is the main line. This stuff, and this stuff, and this stuff. You will not see a great amount of consistency from season to season, but that's kind of the point. I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, so to have everyone on the same page, I want to briefly touch on Rei Kawakubo's life and how she became the businesswoman she is today, which is what she calls herself, first and foremost, a businesswoman. Let me just fix that for you, Rei. I, I, I got you. Good. I'm not going to go super in-depth on her, just going to mention key points about her life and rise. She was born on October 11th, 1942. It was just her birthday recently, actually. Happy belated birthday. 80 years old. Insane. She was the oldest of three siblings and the only daughter. Both of her parents were educated people, although her mother stayed home to raise the children while her father worked. A typical family dynamic for the time. However, Ray's mom did not want to go on like that forever. Once her children came of age, Ray's mom wanted to rejoin the workforce, which Ray's dad was like... Uh, 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 for some reason, the, the patriarchy is the reason, I guess. Japan being a prime example of a patriarchal society, even today. This led to her mother getting a divorce, which was a rarity in Japanese culture at the time. And I'm sure having such a brave mother figure is definitely a reason for Rei's fierceness and defiance as the woman she is today. Rei attended the same university that her father worked at. Awkward, but also unusual again for a woman of that time to do that. You might be surprised to hear that she never actually formally studied fashion design. She studied fine art and literature, which is still a relevant degree of course, but interesting to note nonetheless. She learned about Eastern and Western art as well as traditional and modern forms. It seems to me that this idea of duality was consistent throughout her whole life, and so she got to see clear contrast in everything around her, such as in her mom and dad, which I think is an essential idea to be exposed to in becoming a well-balanced person. After university, she luckily got a job in the advertising department of a textile company, where she also worked as a stylist and had quite a knack for it. In her role, she had a lot of freedom, such as being able to wear her own stylish clothing to work, rather than the standardized uniforms for workers at the time. She began working as a freelance stylist, but was not satisfied with the clothing that she had available to her, which led to her starting Comme des Garcons. <laughs> in 1969. Comme des Garcons, okay, I'll, I'll stop now, I'm sorry. Which by the way, officially translates to like some boys. She was fed up with the clothes available to women at the time and wanted to make clothes for more independent, societally defiant women like her. And so without the help of YouTube, she began designing and quickly found success in Japan and would later find success globally after showing in Paris for the first time in 1981. Ray's style of designing was disruptive to the status quo. At first, she didn't use much color outside of black, she left her clothes unhemmed and fraying and made a lot of asymmetric garments. These were mocked by Manny at the time, but now Manny brands follow her style of distressed, unfinished clothing. You can definitely see how she influenced the likes of Margiela, Raph, McQueen, and Manny more after them. She didn't conform to the fashion standards of the time, and she never has. Even today, as she's progressed making clothes, expanding her business and starting new ventures like Dover Street Market, the one thing that has inspired her the whole way is the desire to create something new. To cause uncomfort in the viewer for seeing something that they haven't had time to justify in their brain. Ray believes that the fundamental human problem is that people are afraid of change. And I agree with her. Here's, here's a quote from a 2020 interview with her by another magazine. The human brain always looks for harmony and logic. When harmony is denied, where there is no logic, when there is dissonance, a powerful moment is created which leads you to feel an inner turmoil and attention. That can lead to finding positive change and progress. And so our first insight into the mind of Ray comes with this idea of creating something truly new. And while that sounds like an intimidating idea, I feel like in some ways we all chase novelty in our own lives. Except we do it on our own terms, where we're comfortable. 
Fashion is all about what's new, and while Ray doesn't follow trends, she has the same desires as any designer working today to create something new. But she has the courage to acknowledge this idea of chasing newness, and she sees how she can achieve the best version of it, no matter the cost. And in my opinion, she has dedicated her whole life towards this goal. Here are some direct quotes from various recent interviews that I want to discuss. From a 2018 interview with The Guardian, she said, What she would really like would be to get a new brain each season, but she can't. So she has to find a new method to come at, at the work. Nine seasons ago, she thought, maybe if I don't try to make clothes, I will be able to make something new. In a series of emails between Ray and Bjork, Ray said that the space I need is the space where 50 years of experience can be obliterated. When asked about reference points in a 2019 interview by Dezine, she said, no reference points. I try to avoid reference points. That's the whole point. I want to make things that people have never seen before. There's no reference point. If anything, I avoid any reference points. I feel like I can succeed more in making something that hasn't existed before if I don't look for reference points. And near the end of the interview with The Guardian, she says, there is no pleasure in the work. People who say they enjoy the work don't take it seriously. The only way to hope to make something new is not to be satisfied. From these quotes, it's quite clear to see how someone with this mindset progressed from making clothes like this to this. Maybe at the beginning of her career, she did not have this exact mindset. But now she does. And I think that's what is most important. Living in what exists now. Last quote I want to add about her before talking about them is one from an interview she had with Andrew Bolton in regards to the 2017 exhibition of her work at the Met. Ray being the second designer to ever get their own exhibition at the Met while alive. The first being Yves Saint Laurent. It seems that the Met tends to do rec retrospectives, but Ray has such a massive body of work and has been so influential, why not embrace her while she's alive on her terms? Anyway, she says, In terms of my work, the only way forward is not to look back. For me, there are many clothes I've made that I regret or that I would have done differently. And if she was to create her own exhibition, she says, I would include only my last seven collections, beginning with Spring Summer 14. There where my mind is at right now, at this very moment. Okay, lots to dig in here, but generally, these quotes form the basic idea around Ray's work. And again, I'm only looking at mainline Comme des Garçons, not any other lines where Ray experiments with her clothes in different ways. Also, I want to acknowledge how easy it is to look at everything that she's saying and get lost on either side of pretentiousness. Or you might think that she's being too pretentious and that stops you from letting yourself get anything out of what she's saying. Or you think that everything she said is flawless and you're worshipping her every word. I think that doing either is ignorant, so I'm going to be talking about my own interpretations of what she said and stay true to what I believe. And I encourage you to do the same. Listen to her, listen to me, then make up your own mind. She said it before that she takes herself very seriously, which I do have respect for, especially these days where being genuine means being a bit cringe. But at the same time, I personally like to have, uh, have a bit of fun, you know, have a, a bit of banter, have a laugh, as they say. I wonder what Ray's sense of humor is. <laughs> if she's even capable of laughing, who knows? Anyway, although her clothes are not wearable, she even states that she tries not to make clothing anymore, she still follows every fashion designer's quest to of creating something new. But again, interprets that extremely literally. Honestly, I think that's all you have to hear in order to understand her work. While each collection does have different themes, she doesn't have physical references and she truly doesn't want you to understand or like her work because that means she's failed in making something completely new. And to be honest, I feel like I fell for her trap. I briefly touched on her recent collection on my Patreon where I reviewed some of the great shows that happened during Spring Summer 23. I also talked about the whole Kanye Yeezy debacle in a separate video on there if you want to check it out. But when I got to Comme des Garçons, I couldn't really formulate my thoughts. I looked at this collection and thought, Okay, nice one, nice one, Ray. Whatever it is you're doing, you, you did it again. But my reaction was basically me seeing something that I couldn't rationalize and going, let's just let's just move on to something I can I can analyze and I feel more comfortable talking about. The writer who reviewed the collection on Vogue Runway said the same thing. He said how trying to review this collection made him remember the imposter syndrome that he felt when he first started reviewing normal fashion shows in real life. That was new to him at the time, so he was uncomfortable. This is new to him now as he was filling in for the person who usually reviews Comme des Garçons shows. And so although Oh, it's technically just another show it's a cdg show so he's uncomfortable and so was i so how do you approach analyzing the show so to say if these aren't close to be worn on the street or even to the met then what is being presented and that's up to your interpretation oh do you do you want to hear mine to me these are all primary sources of ideas in history Primary sources are immediate first-hand accounts of events. Secondary sources are retellings of events by someone who did not experience them firsthand. And so if you apply that same logic to art, primary sources are untouched places of inspiration, like nature or other forms of art than your own. Secondary sources are other designers' interpretations of those things. Someone like Margiela, who is constantly referenced in fashion, is... <coughs> Oh my god. Someone like Margiela, who is constantly referenced in fashion, 
would be a secondary source. This isn't a concrete idea, by the way, I'm just making it up. I think it's a good way to rationalize Ray's work. You can't really judge or compare nature. You can do that with the feelings you get from it, but other than evolutionary reasons, there are no aesthetic choices being made as to why a flower looks like a flower. So how can you really critique it? And it feels the same when I try to judge Ray's work. If, as she says, she uses no reference points, then what we see each season is raw output that seemingly comes from nowhere. Obviously, that's not possible for a person to do, but I'm sure if anyone could get close to that, it would be Ray. She wishes that she could delete everything that she knew because then she could see things in a different light, which is a fascinating idea about the role that outsiders play in various industries. She even mentions how she wishes she could be a part of the outsider art movement, which is art made by self-taught or supposedly naive artists with typically little or no contact with the conventions of the art world. They don't look at other art, they create their own art in their own bubbles. You could also call me a bit of an outsider fashion cricket. Cricket. You could also call me a bit of an outsider fashion critic, eh? So what do you do with these primary sources of ideas? Well, what do you do with nature? You can just enjoy it for what it is, or you can take inspiration from it. There is no right answer, but trying to critique it feels redundant. Another example of a man-made primary source to me is the book Codex Seraphinianus, which seems to take inspiration from the Voynich manuscript. The Codex is a book written in a made-up language in the format of an encyclopedia full of bizarre nonsensical drawings. It's like an encyclopedia from an alien planet, and it's just so interesting to look through, but like Ray's work, because a person made it, it has to be based on some pre-existing knowledge, like the fact that languages and trees exist. Regardless, it evokes such a curiosity in me to see things that I can't make sense of. I love it. And I want to start looking at Ray's work this way, rather than being intimidated and just wanting to move on. I feel a little silly for uh, feeling like that when I first was looking at Ray's work, but hey, you gotta learn somehow. I think that everyone in fashion is powered by like a little motor that desires new stuff again and again. And Again, Ray is very honest about the reality of this idea. It's exhausting. She is constantly unsatisfied with her work and hates looking back. It sounds like a harsh reality, but it is just reality. In another magazine, she says, I am afraid I won't be able to create anymore unless I keep going. Once I stop, that would be it. It is that fear that keeps me moving forward. So like anyone should do in the face of fear and unsatisfaction, she just keeps working. That is her life. She just turned 80 and still works every day, even during the pandemic. A very nihilistic view. I love it. I'm sure she takes breaks, by the way. I'm not trying to advocate for this hustle grind <laughs> lifestyle where you never stop working. You work 16 hours a day, pal. I'm, I think this is just a way you can look at your work if you also feel this kind of wave of unsatisfaction every time you complete it. Speaking of the pandemic, Ray received more attention than usual because she was the only fashion house to host a real-life fashion show during it in Tokyo to a small audience. And in interviews, she expressed the need to show her clothes in real life and not digitally because digitally clothes lose so much. Let's see some direct quotes from her about it, shall we? All from another magazine. When asked why she chose to show in real life opposed to digitally, she said, I always want people to look at the clothes themselves and for the audience to see clothes on real people. Clothes deliver our messages better when they are worn. It is difficult to explain in words, but once the clothes are put on people, all their elements come into harmony and start showing their strength. That is because people and clothes step closer to each other, I think. And that Digital media would not be able to convey half the things I want to express. At a live show, you're able to feel things. The power of the clothes and the effort that has gone into making them. The atmosphere and the presence of people wearing them in front of you. For her, expressing her work completely digitally is a deviation. The clothes are still shown online, of course, but you don't truly get the same experience. And that, in my opinion, is the true power of clothing and fashion. Experiencing it in real life, not digitally. And that's also why I would love to attend a fashion show in real life. Not to critique it, just to watch it and enjoy. I think what makes fashion so special to me over other art mediums is how connected it is to real life and how it is perceived differently than digitally. I've been to plenty of museums and seen famous artworks, I've been to movie theaters, I've heard music live, but honestly all of those things can be experienced in only slightly worser versions at home, in my opinion. The only thing close to witnessing fashion in real life is a concert, but not because of the music. Music most of the time sounds terrible <laughs> in at real life concerts, but that's not why I go. I go because of all the people and the energy that you get from that. Because fashion is basically objects, a picture can never really do it justice, in the same way that seeing famous monuments or nature just can't be the same as looking at photos at it. It's a hard feeling to describe, but I hope you understand. And the more and more life seems to go towards this technology and social media dominated thing, the more I want to just get away from that. Being terminally online feels like a life of deeply unsatisfying comfort, and I hate that. I hate that I can be so comfortable, yet I have a deep sense of dissatisfaction because of it. And so even though I make YouTube videos on fashion, I try my best not to engage with social media at all. 
I love doing things. <laughs> that feeling of experiencing something new, like Rei Kawakubo's work in real life, is a feeling I very rarely get from looking at things online. Personally, I've been stuck in this rut of being comfortable by working online, and then when I encountered Rei's clothes that made me uncomfortable, I just, I was too quick to move past it. I know it seems like I'm rambling here and injecting my own personal beliefs as if that's what Ray meant, but this is genuinely how I felt after reading uh, these pandemic interviews with her. I was reminded of how much I enjoy the physicality of things compared to their digital counterparts. I have one last point to make about Ray and Combe Garçon, so let me finish this train of thought with a quote from her from the same Another Magazine interview. I am happy if I can make something that inspires some people. If you want to make something, you must make an effort and never stop. I believe that it is true for other kinds of work too. Comme des Garçons owes what it is now to those who have dedicated their lives to manufacturing, at times at a cost to their personal lives. It is their work and efforts that form the foundation upon which we have built what we have today. We must carry on to advance further. What I am afraid of is that if the situation continues, people might start to feel like giving up. They may stop expressing themselves and vocalizing their presence. In that case, a mood for being the same as everybody else would prevail, and then the world becomes infertile. I know that she's talking about the pandemic, but these words ring true today, after the pandemic as well. The internet has rapidly increased globalization around the world, which sets the mood for being the same as everybody else. This is why I say not to get inspiration from Pinterest or other popular online image sources, because everyone is, and everyone is fed the same things. Therefore, we all kind of create the same things. There's obviously more to this topic, but I'm going to leave it at that so that I can touch on one last thing that I want to talk about in regards to Ray. But as always, share your thoughts. I'm not claiming to know best or even say that this is what Ray means and that it works for everybody. Just my thoughts on her words. So this last point, understanding Ray, is understanding how her company functions and why I see it as such an amazing, pure, artistic powerhouse. I know to her it's a business, but it's always come out with some of the most profound ideas in fashion and art. Their advertisements were literally the best in the game. I'm not as sure about them today because I don't really see much advertising anymore, but they were shocking and new and always attacking fashion standards. Sometimes they wouldn't even show clothes and people were outraged by that. Ray's Dover Street Markets are some of the most highly praised shops to visit around the world for their unique interiors and for the unique range of clothing that they offer. I love how Ray uses her influence to create a shop like this and host other designers that deserve a platform. I've also already spent this entire video explaining why CDG's clothes stand out. So how does CDG do it all? Here's how. As Ray says, I do all the graphic design, the architecture for all of the shops, the furniture. You know the Dover Street Market? I do all the installations. All the Comme des Garçons brand installations, I design them all as well. If my eyes aren't on it, it's not Comme des Garçons. And she is constantly designing and changing things, including Dover Street Market interiors. So what does that tell you? Ray is extremely talented, yes. But also, everything that the brand does is one person's vision, not a boardroom's. CDG has no parent company like LVMH or Caring watching over their revenue. Ray owns the company and her husband is the CEO so that she can design. The reason I'm stressing this fact is because I think that this is how art is best done. When I say I hate the business side of fashion, I don't necessarily mean the marketing that has to be done to sell products. I mean the decisions that are made by the shareholders and the top business people, the stuff that is clearly done to appeal to the public and maximize sales. There's going to be more ups and downs when it's a company that's coming from one person's vision, but they're going to be so much more stronger and clear rather than with a any other brand where most of the time it's just going to be neutral. That's the feeling you're going to get. Comme des Garçons does have its own commercial CDG play line and fair enough, it has it has to be done. And if it's done to raise standards, then I gotta say, I feel like she barely puts much thought into it, which is a shame. And I don't like that. See, I'm still capable of criticizing her. But I mean, if she does overlook literally everything else that goes on and does it all so well, and I'll give her I'll give her a break on CDG play. I think that art never works as well when it has to be managed by large groups of people. Ray isn't just the creative director of CDG, she is CDG, which you can't say about any other brands, really. A good example of watered-down crap being produced is what we're seeing in cinema right now. Marvel movie after Netflix murder series, after prequel, after sequel, after reboot, after Marvel movie. I feel like a lot of things right now just aren't original anymore. And I don't think it's because everything has been done. I think it's because we need more people like Ray who understand what it takes to make something new by taking risks, by being yourself, being uncomfortable, challenging, challenging everything. But we only need people like that if that's what the world wants. If the world wants everyone to be like everyone else, then I guess the world can just become infertile. I think I'm going to leave it at that. I'm not sure how this video is going to come off to everyone who watches it. I try to be very genuine. I feel like I was a bit preachy at times. A lot of strong opinions thrown around. Ugh. I feel like I just got a load off my chest. These videos are, are therapy sessions for me. <laughs> 
I don't expect that what I'm saying will work for everyone and that there are no positive experiences to be had online, by the way. Just want to clear that up. There's more to everything that I've touched on, but I am, after all, just a guy alone in my room expressing my thoughts to a screen. So I don't have another perspective there for immediate feedback to really hear how I sound. So feel free to challenge me or agree or just share your thoughts. Anything's fine, except hate speech. So I better make sure Kanye doesn't comment. <laughs> Speaking of Kanye, you can hear my thoughts about Kanye and the rest of Fashion Month that just went on at my Patreon. Go check it out if you want to support me and just get more content. I'm not going to be uploading weekly here anymore. I'm going to just be uploading whenever I want. But on Patreon, mo mostly weekly. <laughs> All right. Cool. Thanks, guys. Comedy Scar